Hello and welcome. This talk will give you a very basic introduction to anesthesia. The talk was created specifically for the medical students rotating through the Department of Anesthesia at the Dr. George Macari Academic Hospital in their fifth year, but it can also be useful for interns or for anybody like technical staff or nursing staff who will be exposed to the practice of anesthesia for the first time. So just a very basic introduction into the art of anesthesia. So the first thing that we need to ask ourselves is, what is anesthesia? So anesthesia is a state of temporary induced loss of sensation or awareness, and it includes central hypnosis or sedation, analgesia or pain relief, and muscle relaxation, if indicated. These three concepts together are known as the triad of anesthesia. If we need to do a full general anesthetic for abdominal surgery, for example, we will use all three aspects. However, we can also do regional anesthesia, for example, with a spinal injection of local anesthetic, and then we don't necessarily have to induce hypnosis and muscle relaxation. So, practically, the how-to of a general anesthetic can be divided into five sections. Pre-medication, induction, muscle relaxation if required, maintenance of anesthesia, and analgesia. Let's look at each of these sections in more detail. So the purpose of pre-medication is to get the patient to relax before the operation and to help with reducing the sympathetic response to airway management during induction. Pre-medication can either be given orally before the patient comes to theatre, or it can be intravenously on the operating table. There are a couple of different things that you can give the patient. An oral pre-med could be a benzodiazepine like midazolam or diazepam, and if the patient didn't have an oral pre-med, you can also give them a bit of midazolam intravenously on the table to make them feel a bit more relaxed. This is especially useful if you're going to be doing a procedure like a nerve block before you induce general anesthetic. Then we can also give some medication to blunt the intubation response. In other words, to prevent the patient having hypertension and tachycardia in response to intubation or airway management. Usually we will use a synthetic opioid like fentanyl or sufentanyl. Now just a quick note, the term opiate refers to drugs that are natural derivatives of opium or the poppy plant, for example codeine and morphine. The term opioid on the other hand refers to synthetic or semi-synthetic components that have been created in a laboratory and that bind to the same opioid receptors as the natural opiates. The reason why we use the synthetic opioids is because they have a faster onset of action um, of within a few minutes and they have a shorter duration of action, about 30 minutes, compared to morphine. Another drug that we use before induction is lignocaine. And there are two reasons why we use it. If you give a small dose of, let's say, 40 milligrams, 2 milliliters, and you allow the lignocaine to bind to the blood vessel by occluding the vein after injection, you can numb the blood vessel a bit so that the medications you give later will not burn and hurt the patient as much. Drugs like propofol, etomidate, and even rocuronium can burn quite a bit when you inject them. But you can also give a larger dose of 1 to 1.5 milligram per kilogram, and then it will also help to blunt the intubation response. And this can be very useful for patients where you can't use opioids, for example, um, pregnant patients. Now, please note, you get two forms of lignocaine. There's an IV form and a subcutaneous form. Please never ever give the subcutaneous form intravenously. It has a, pre a preservative that we can't give IV. Also note that we usually use the 1% or the 2% intravenous solutions of lignocaine for, for induction or for pre-medication. Now here's a handy tip. Whenever you see a drug label that has a percentage sign, like here on the lignocaine box, 
Take the percentage number and times it by 10 and you will get the strength of the drug in milligrams per mole. That is quite a nice trick to, to know of. So the percentage number times 10 gives you milligrams per mole. Induction of general anesthesia is when we make the patient sleep or when we induce hypnosis. Now, in terms of induction agents, we have a few different choices, including propofol, etomidate, thiopentone, and ketamine. Which one to use depends on what you have available, the anesthetist's experience, and also on your patient characteristics. Depending on the patient's condition, you may choose one induction agent over another. Now, propofol is the most commonly used induction agent, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time to tell you about it. It's called the milk of amnesia because of its white milky color and because it induces amnesia. Propofol works by activating the GABA receptor complex in the brain, which is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter complex, and also by inhibiting the stimulatory NMDA receptors. Propofol has a number of benefits. First of all, it has a very quick onset, and then it has all these other anti-benefits that I've listed. Antipruritis, so it helps for itching. It's anti-emetic, helps for nausea and vomiting. It's anticonvulsant. And then it's also bronchodilatory, and as we said already, it can induce amnesia. It does, however, also have side effects like pain on injection, it causes a significant drop in blood pressure after an induction dose. And there is a risk of bacterial con contamination of the actual substance, um, especially if you, if you leave the vial open for a long period of time. So once you've drawn up your propofol, you need to use it within six hours after opening. The other thing to know is that patients will develop respiratory depression after um, an induction dose of propofol, so you must be ready to support their, their breathing. After induction, we can then give the patient a muscle relaxant if it is indicated. Indications for muscle relaxant can be surgery related or ventilation related. For abdominal surgery, the patient is usually muscle relaxed to make the surgery easier. For orthopedic procedures, muscle relaxation is not usually required. But sometimes we still need to control the patient's ventilation. And then we may also need to give the patient a muscle relaxant. Now there are two types of muscle relaxants. Depolarizing and non-depolarizing muscle relaxants. The only depolarizing muscle relaxant that we have is saxomethonium. Sax has a lot of side effects, but its one benefit is that it has a very rapid onset of action and a short duration of action. Then we have a few non-depolarizing agents like rocuronium, vecuronium, atricurium, and cisatricurium. I'm not going to go into the details of each of these, but they each have a different onset of action duration and side effect profile that you can look at. Now during maintenance, we need to keep the patient asleep and we also need to maintain their airway and ventilation. So let's look at airway maintenance first. Depending on the kind of procedure and the duration of the procedure, and also on how carefully we need to control the patient's ventilation, you can either intubate the patient with an endotracheal tube, as illustrated here, or you can place a laryngeal mask airway, as shown here. Note that with an endotracheal tube, we place the tube below the level of the vocal cords, and we inflate a cuff here. This allows for better control of ventilation, and it also protects against aspiration of gastric content. With a, with a laryngeal mask airway, or LMA, we place the device on top of the larynx, before the vocal cords. The LMA is usually used when a patient will be breathing spontaneously under anesthesia. So let's look at a couple more examples of these. 
In terms of endotracheal tubes or ET tubes for short, you will see there are lots of different sizes and we select the right size according to the patient's age and gender. For women, we usually use a size 7 or 7.5 and for adult men, we usually use a 7.5 or 8. For children, we can use anything from a size 2 to a size 6 depending on their age and weight. For adults, we will always use a cuffed tube, but for children, we can sometimes have tubes that do not have a cuff. And then we get tubes of different shapes. For example, this oral ray tube, which is used during tonsillectomy so that the tube is out of the way of the surgeon. And we get tubes that are shaped specifically for nasal intubation. As far as LMAs are concerned, there are lots of different types available on the market, but what they all have in common is that they sit on top of the larynx. And as we said, we will usually see these in use when the patient can be allowed to breathe spontaneously, and also when the procedure will be less than two hours in duration. So that's the airway. But now the next thing to consider is how we are going to keep the patient asleep. Because your induction agent only works for a few minutes, and if you don't give them anything else, they are going to wake up. Now, we can either use an inhalation agent or a vapor to keep the patient asleep, or we can do a total intravenous anesthetic or TIVA, usually using propofol. Most of the time, we will use the vapor technique, but sometimes there will be indications for TIVA, especially when a patient can't be exposed to a vapor Think here of patients with malignant hyperthermia and certain kinds of surgery like ear, nose and throat procedures. A, a TIVA technique may be, may be more appropriate. Now in terms of the vapors, there are five different ones that you should know about. And you need to know their color coding, their blood gas partition coefficient and their MAC. Now the vapors are halothane in red, influrane in orange. These are the two older agents. And then the newer agents are isoflurane, which is purple, sevoflurane, which is yellow, and desflurane, which is blue. The vapors are delivered into the circuit through a special equipment um, called a vaporizer, and we'll look at how they work in a little while. With the vapors, we said there are two concepts we need to understand, and that's the MAC and the blood gas partition coefficient. So what is the MAC? It is the minimum alveolar concentration at which 50% of patients will not have a motor response to a standard surgical stimulus or surgical incision. The MAC is the marker of potency of the vapor. It tells me relatively how much vapor I need to use to have an effect. The blood gas partition coefficient, on the other hand, is the ratio of the amount of vapor dissolved in the blood versus the amount of vapor in gaseous form that is not dissolved. This is therefore a measure of solubility, and it gives us an idea of the onset of action of the drug. Now with the vapors, um, so if we're now going to look at this, let's compare desflurane and halothane. Halothane has a MAC of 0.75% versus desflurane that has a MAC of 6%. So this means that halothane is far more potent than desflurane. You only need 0.75% of halothane in the alveolus to have the same effect as a whole 6% of desflurane. So you need a lot more desflurane to have the same effect. But the blood gas partition coefficient is where the beauty of desflurane lies. It is only 0.42, which means that it is not very soluble in blood, as opposed to halothane, which you can see is much more soluble in blood. So halothane needs to dissolve first before it can have an effect on the brain, whereas desflurane has a much faster onset of action because it doesn't need to dissolve in the blood. And the reverse is also true. If you turn off the, des the desflurane vaporizer, Desflurane will wash out of the body much quicker than halothane, so the patient will wake up a lot faster. So keeping desflurane in mind, let's look at the other two vapors that are commonly used and that you will be seeing um, in theater during your rotation. That is sevoflurane. So sevoflurane has a MAC value of 2%. 
and a blood gas partition coefficient of 0 0.65. So it's more potent than desflurane, um, and it also has a low solubility, but it's still not as low as desflurane. Isoflurane is definitely more potent than desflurane and sevoflurane, but it has a much higher blood gas partition coefficient, so, so it takes slightly longer to work and slightly longer to, um, to wash out. So let's look at the vaporizers. So as we said, the vapors are added to the anesthetic circuit by vaporizers, and it's a piece of equipment that delivers a known and controlled amount of vapor into the anesthetic circuit. So if we're going to draw the vaporizer more simply, as we see in this image from HowEquipmentWorks.com, we see that basically it has an inlet for fresh gas, a dial to set the concentration you want, a bypass channel, um, and a common outlet, and then a vaporizing chamber. So gas uh, fresh gas comes in through your through your fresh gas inlet and then it goes into the vaporizing chamber picks up some vapor and then it goes out through the common inlet and then finally it goes into the lungs where it starts to have its effect on a very basic level if you set the control dial to a low percentage most of the fresh gas will go into the bypass channel and very little will actually go into the vaporizing chamber to pick up vapor particles. On the other hand, if you set the control dial to a higher percentage, you allow more fresh gas into the vaporizing chamber to collect more particles, thereby increasing the concentration of the vapor in the fresh gas. Now this works very well for isoflurane and sevoflurane, but it does not work for desflurane. So desflurane is special. It has a very low boiling point of 23 degrees Celsius at sea level, even lower at altitude. Where all the other vapors are in liquid form at room temperature, desflurane is transitioning to a gas form. So if you have a small increase in room temperature, for example from 20 degrees to 22 degrees, you actually take desflurane from liquid to boiling and gas form very quickly. So if you use the same vaporizer as you would for isoflurane, that means that you're going to have more vapor particles available. So you're going to set your concentration dial, but as the temperature in the room goes up, you're actually going to have more vapor particles than what you expect. So we have a special circuit, a special vaporizing circuit for, for desflurane. And I'm going to put this picture again from HowEquipmentWorks.com. And basically, to, to, to overcome the problem with desflurane, um, the desflurane is kept in a separate little chamber and it is heated to 40 degrees Celsius. At this temperature, the room temperature changes will make no difference. And then the desflurane is injected into the fresh gas flow um, going into the patient. And there's a complex computer feedback mechanism here that make sure that as your fresh gas flow increases, the amount of desflurane being injected is adjusted accordingly. Please go and have a look at HowEquipmentWorks.com if you want a bit more in-depth information here. Lastly, we're going to look at analgesia or pain relief, and that's a really important part of anesthesia. Everything we've done up to now has helped to make or keep the patient asleep, but we haven't done anything to manage their pain yet. So let's look at some of the options. Intravenous paracetamol is a very good pain relief medication. The oral form has a bioavailability of 70%, 70 but if you give it intravenously, the drug is 100% bioavailable. And we will usually give this at the beginning of the procedure to reduce pain. In certain patients, we can use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or NSAIDs, but we do need to be aware of the side effects and limitations. It can interfere with your clotting. It increases your risk for stomach ulcers and for kidney damage. And it can lead to myocardial infarctions. And then there is a lesser known complication that you should be aware of. Some patients develop necrotizing fasciitis from intramuscular injections of NSAIDs. So we just need to be aware of these complications and side effects. 
Another option for pain relief is opiates and opioids, either as stat doses or as continuous infusions during the procedure. And they are really the mainstay of um, analgesia for, for most patients. But there is a move towards what we call multimodal analgesia, where we try to rely less on the opiates and opioids because of all their side effects. And these side effects include drowsiness, headaches, nausea and vomiting, urticaria, constipation, urinary retention. So they are very helpful, but if we can use alternative means, then we would actually prefer to do that nowadays and limit the amount of opioid analgesia that you're giving the patient. A very good way to, to prevent using too much opioids and opiates is to do regional anesthesia. So regional anesthesia, we try to block groups of nerves together so that we reduce pain perception. Here we see a picture of a brachial plexus block being done using ultrasound guidance and local anesthetic medication is placed around the brachial plexus and then it blocks all the pain impulses from the upper limb and it will work for three to four hours depending on the drugs that you use. And this allows us to really limit the, the amount of additional medications that we need to give for pain relief. Another form of regional anesthesia that you're going to see a lot of during your rotation is spinal or subarachnoid injections or epidural injections. One of the differences between spinals and epidurals is that with a spinal you give a once-off injection, whereas with an epidural you can place a little catheter inside and you can give a continuous infusion or repeated top-up doses. Both very effective modes of pain relief for your patient. Just one other difference in terms of the spinal and the epidural is where the needle is placed. With a spinal you go through the dura mater and the arachnoid mater and to confirm placement you get CSF coming back into your needle. So it's just like doing a lumbar puncture in medical patients except we use much smaller needles. Um, your epidural, on the other hand, is a needle that goes on top of the dura mater. So you go through the ligamentum flavum, but not through the dura mater. And that's where you then place your catheter. Alright, so thanks for watching. I hope that this video was helpful and that you will understand a little bit better what is happening around you when you start your rotation in theatre. Goodbye.